What's going on, my friends out here on the Hey Look Squirrel YouTube channel and the Squirrel Squad? How we doing, guys? It's good to see you. Uh, strap in. This is going to be a long one. 28-minute video here. I have been waiting to do this. I've been wanting to jump into these Divna videos where he talks about uh, the steam power, the industrial age, all those different things. I know there's a couple different series. This one is the industrial age. This is wind, water, and steam. This is episode one. Uh, I'm not going to barrel through these and punch them out quick or anything like that, but I do want to start peppering them in throughout, uh, you know, throughout the different uploads that I'm doing here and start really trying to get back into doing a little bit of Divna. So, oh, one second. That's better. All right. You folks ready? Let's do this. Washing machine. My great interest in the mechanics of the past stems from when I was like our Jack, you know, when I was quite a small boy, going along the canal from Bolton to Bury and seeing the remains of all the old coal mines and the cotton mill engine houses. And some of them were actually still working. That's really why I've created all this lot here in my backyard. And it's sort of a vain attempt to hang on to childhood memories, I suppose. I can't help but smile during this intro. You see his name being written all fancy in the cursive writing across the screen. Industrially, just, you know, the biggest badge comes up. And I just can't help but think, like, how, like, this never, ever would have been part of Fred's life had he not been discovered and somebody else did this for him and made these series because he just wasn't a fancy guy from what I've gathered so far, you know? He was a, he was a man's man. He was a man back when men still wanted to be men pretty good. This is the Bancroft Mill Engine Trust and up until 1978 there was a big weaving shed out the back you know this is all that remains of it the engine the chimney and the boiler and it's situated at Barn Oldswick on the Lancashire and Yorkshire borders. We've turned it now into an industrial heritage centre where everybody can come and see the original mill engine in steam. There used to be loads of engines like this where I come from. Every coal mine and every spinning mill had one. But at last they've all gone now. Incredible. This is the Bolton to Bury Canal. And as a small boy, I used to come along here with my father on my bicycle and to me it was quite an exciting world, you know, there were like coal mines and, and cotton mills and all sorts of wonderful things like incline railways, really, really interesting stuff if you, if you like industrial archaeology. Like this crane here, the first time I saw it, it was almost complete and now of course there's hardly anything left of it, you know, it had all the brass on and chimney on it and the chain on it and everything and what it used to do, the boats used to pull up here and, and they had boxes in full of coal and the crane used to lift one out and swing round and drop it down into the paper mill. Britain was the birthplace of the industrial revolution and although machinery like this is now sadly decaying for more than 200 years we led the world in harnessing the power of coal, water and steam to drive the heavy machinery that made mass production possible. It's an era that I only saw the end of, but I wish I'd have seen more of it. It's oh, only it within the last 40 odd years that our great industries have disappeared. Truly, Fred. In the 60s, the skylines of Lancashire Mill Town still bristled with chimneys. And the view of Sheffield by night was something like Dante's Inferno with the glow of the furnaces lighting the sky and of rivers of glowing white hot molten steel flowing through the smoke. 
slip and fall, and then you're done. <laughs> done. As the mines, the mills, and the factories, and the steel worksies, and the engineering worksies closed, the demolition men moved in, and the machinery that had made Britain the workshop of the world came under the wreckers' hammer. The scrap merchants became wealthy as they stripped the brass and anything else that was worth having from the engines. Those people didn't care about what was going on, but there were a few who realised that, that it was all a bit tragic, and that if something wasn't done about it, there'd be nothing left to show for one of the most important parts of our history. People started to restore old engines, and steam locomotive preservation societies began to appear. 30 miles an hour! <laughs> <laughs> Thanks to the interest and dedication of these people, a small part of our industrial story has been preserved for future generations. You think about it, I mean, when you start going in with hammers and stuff and start busting up these old machines, like, like you're erasing history. And I, that's probably not how they thought of it. They were just like, hey, we need to get all this stuff out of here because, you know, this like uh, this building we could probably use for something else or whatever the, you know, what we were going to scrap it and make money, whatever. But. You know, it's so sad you don't think about it at the time, and then you look back and you're like, man, you know. I mean, I don't even know. Like, I had an old Camaro when I was a kid. It was brand new when I was a kid, and now I look back and like, I just still had that Camaro. Wow. I mean, how many, how many people have done that, right? We've all looked back at cars and we're like, man. <laughs> I'm off now on a tour of Britain in search of our industrial past and the people who, who've restored a great deal of it to save it from the scrap man. And so future generations can see what a wonderful race Great Britain at one time was in, in the engineering field. My interest is mainly in steam, but the earliest form of power is one that's still with us. I went down to Shropshire to meet a man who's taken on a job in his back garden that's even bigger than anything I've got in mind. I was in a sad way. Yeah. Um, no machinery left. No. That no. had fallen down some years mm. ago and been sold yeah. for scrap. Mm -hmm. uh, Peter windmill. Lewis has spent the last 16 years restoring this windmill around the back of his house. Have to remember to take the ladder away each day. The windmill that Peter's restoring is a tower mill, and the sails are attached to the cap at the top. Oh, this is the bit that makes it face into the wind, eh? Yes, 24 yeah. hours a day that goes round, keeps yeah. it facing the wind. Yeah, it's really carpentry on a grand scale, this, isn't it? <laughs> Aye. Great lumps of foot square and two mm. foot square and 18 inches square. <laughs> Uh, yeah, and I believe you can disconnect it here and make it all go down by hand in that's right. case of disaster. You've got to have some means of coping if the yeah. fan goes wrong. So this is what we do. Mm. High technology. Mm. Yeah. Well, it works. Necessity is the mother of invention. Put the handle on. Yeah. Off we go. Oh, roundabout job. Mm. Free tour. Yeah. See, the Majolly Miller up here in his smog, <laughs> thunder and lightning and, and of course 10 gale blow. Aye. Yeah. Tell so these two guys just climbed up, went out, and Fred was like, oh yeah, you can adjust it manually. And the guy's like, oh yeah, you just put this rope up, you lock this up, you put this crank on, and the whole thing that with them on it just starts turning. Right? One guy turning this handle, and it's spinning the whole thing with them on it. You know, nowadays, somebody's cell phone battery dies, and it's a frickin' crisis. Our mills aren't the only kind of windmill. My travels took me to East Anglia, where I found another type called the post mill. If you want to see a good example of a post mill, East Suffolk is the place to come. Like the East Suffolk post mills were reputed to be amongst the best in the world. And here at Saxted Green is a wonderful example of one. The fantail on the post mill is much lower and that's because it's not just the top that turns to face the sails into the wind but the wall windmill. So with the post mill you can turn the wall building round and if you've not got any wind the corn grinding comes to an halt. Oh Jonathan, now then. Well, hello Fred, <laughs> nice to see you. Oh, what, what's this operation you're performing at present? Well, the old mill has got what we call tail winded. Yeah. Which it very rarely does. Yeah. And that means it wasn't facing the wind properly. Yeah. So we just have to get a little helping hand yeah. to get it into get the wind. It. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah. How many how many tons are you actually turning round with this handle? 
Well, I reckon that's uh, about 18 tonnes. Yeah. There's, <laughs> there's about six tonnes of sails altogether, and, yeah. and two tonnes of stones mm. and the superstructure. Do, do you yeah. want to have a go? Yeah. Well, You're a strong chap. Quite fantastic. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> wow. Wait a minute. It's quite easy, isn't it? Oh, really? yes. Uh, yeah. 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 It'll be all right when you get to the next <laughs> parish. Yes. <laughs> You'd never get 10 mile an hour. This has got to be really one of the finest examples of corn grinding windmill technology. But of course, for windmills, you need wind. <laughs> Water was a much more reliable source of power and you can still see plenty of examples of working water mills around the country. There's a really cool place uh, near me. It's called Old Sturbridge Village. It's in the next town over. It's funny because if you're local and you live in the state and people say, oh, where are you from? I go, oh, from a little town called Brookfield right next to Sturbridge. They're like, oh, Old Sturbridge Village. Everybody knows it. Everybody and their brother went there for like a, a field trip in elementary school to learn about history what they did was um they basically took a bunch of houses from all over the place i thought it was just massachusetts but it's not it's 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 from all over uh mostly in new england though uh they took them apart board by board nail by nail and reconstructed them at this place so a lot of these are the original houses um and these the people that work there are in character constantly but it's so cool because they have like a sawmill that the saw runs off of a working uh, water wheel. And so a lot of the stuff that, you know, so far that we've seen, you know, with the having the, you know, the, the, the corn grind uh, windmill or, you know, we're about to talk about water wheels and I'm a little bit ahead, but I want to you know tell you about this. Like, that's so cool. It's all in play there. You know what I mean? Like, you got, like I went in, uh, I went there with the kids not too long ago, me and my wife and the boys were there and me and the two older kids went into the bank and the guy was showing us how they pressed notes back in the day and how they made money. Um, so, so cool. I bet Fred would have loved that place. Muncaster Mill is near Ravenglass in Cumbria and the miller's wife Pam gave me a tour. It's got a 13 foot overshot water wheel. That's one where the water comes in over the top and it's connected to the cogs inside the mill which drive the milling machinery. Amazing how nice and quiet it is, isn't it? Yeah, really? well that's um, because of the wooden cogs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But this no. is the pit wheel yeah. that's attached to the water wheel that's yeah, just outside that's the, the other side of the wall. Yeah, yeah. But the wooden cogs are there so that there won't be any sparks from yeah, any metal bits. cause any fires. Yeah, but the, um, you know, the, the, the cogs that are driving the, mm. the millstones are connected to the floor above. Yeah. Where we're actually grinding yeah. corn at yeah. the moment. The grain goes in the hopper and that falls into the wooden piece underneath that moves yeah. about called a yeah. chute. And this is the boat shaped thing underneath. Yeah. And the grain is slowly yeah. drizzled into the centre yeah. of the uh, of the stone called the eye by the spindle that's yeah. laid out a bit. Yeah. It's called the damsel. Anything that goes down yeah. is gravity. Yeah. Anything that comes up, we need yeah. mechanical help. Oh, right, I know. So right, this yeah. is the, uh, the, the rope that from, the, from the sack hoist. Does it work? It certainly <laughs> does, yeah. Give, give it a, a pull. Try. Give it a pull. And you see the sack hoist? There it goes. Oh. See, coming up through the trap door. Yeah, yeah. Everything you see in a water mill like this is similar to what you find in a windmill. Ah. Up until the 18th century, all we had were these things, water wheels and windmills. And then, this came along. People on the train driving by, like, hey, is that? oh, that's Fred Dimner! Well, not exactly steam railways. They came a bit later, but the Ravenglass and Esdale Railway runs right past Muncaster Mill. And I wasn't going to let this beautiful little steam train like this go past without having a ride on it. Extendable roof here. Oh, yes, we... Uh, it's imagine very handy when it's raining out. You can, you can keep drying all weathers in this engine. How old is this 
75 this year. It's jacking all over the tracks. <laughs> Scare the crap out of me. <laughs> oh, this thing fell off the tracks. Bed drive on the train. All the uh, W and J Cookham's magical lubricators on lights. Made in both men, where are they? Well, they've gone now, actually. But the works is still there. Well, there we are then. Yeah. Well, I really enjoyed that. Good. Thank you very much. Yeah. Well yeah. Mm. A lot smoother than a steamroller, that I can tell you. And the very first steam engines weren't very smooth either. They weren't polished, shiny things like this. And they didn't go anywhere. They were much more primitive furs than this. This wonderful thing behind us is a working example of the world's first steam engine. And this is Ian, who is the curator of the Black Country Museum, who's going to tell me how it works. Isn't that right? Well, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's actually the world's very first steam engine that's yeah. recorded, built by Thomas Newcomen in 1712, mm. although he didn't mm. actually build this one. He built mm. the original within mm. about half a mile of here in Dudley. Yeah. Mm. And we built this replica about 15 years ago to see whether it actually worked. Yeah, and yeah. the original worked for nearly 60 years. We've had this about 15. Yeah. And uh, it works most of the time, but yeah. it's like all steam engines, it's, oh, it's a bit of a thing to itself. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Mm. It's used to be called a yeah. fire engine. Yeah. You see the old pans, mm. they said fire engine, yeah. because yeah. it doesn't actually use steam pressure. No, no, it uses no, vacuum. Condenses. So you, oh, yeah. you put the steam in the cylinder, yeah. you put in the cold water, the yeah. cold water creates a vacuum, yeah. mm -hmm. sucks the piston down, yeah. get yeah. to the bottom, let the steam back in, yeah. Yeah. dead simple, yeah. up and down she goes, pumping water from the coal mines and it was built for the Dudley Estates to yeah. drain the water out of the coal mines because horses and wind power just weren't good enough. I never realized that's how they worked, so there we go. The trouble was that the first engines weren't very efficient. After Mr. Newcomb's atmospheric engine, which was basically made of wood, and a bit of a ramshackle affair. It wasn't until 1765 when a famous Scottish engineer, James Watt, came along and he did a lot of important things. He invented the parallel motion at the other end of the beam. And then the other important thing, he stuck the crank on the other end of the connecting rod and made a wheel go round. And that was the prototype for the next 100 years for all the steam engines up till 1860 period. The beam engine became the workhorse of the Industrial Revolution and in its most crude form pumped water from the mines and then in its later development into a reciprocating steam engine it powered the ironworks, textile mills and any sort of factory that needed power. These days, really, the only steam engines you can come across that actually work are the ones that have been preserved for posterity and future generations to look at. And here at Glen Cleven, near Carnarvon in North Wales, in these buildings behind me, there's, there's a beautiful steam engine built in 1854. The thing is, I initially came here to do up the chimney stack. And when I first came, it was such a sad sight, the buildings behind here, the chimney were covered in ivy and looked like a Cornish tin mine. Uh, the buildings had holes in the roof and trees growing out of window openings and all of that. And the steam engine were in a really, really sad state. When I finished the chimney, I managed to secure the contract for doing up the steam engine, which I spent roughly 18 months with two other lads. Uh, that. Oh, that's it. When I first come through that door, I think somewhere around about 1988, and looked at this thing, it was in a terrible state, you know, it was absolutely rusted solid, and it had been vandalised and all the brass bits had gone. So I took it all back home to Bolton, and took a shaving off everything, and brought it back and reassembled it. And we, we, we've got to do quite a bit here, I mean, number one, this shiny bit here, 
the, the, we actually made the flywheel go round by using a, an oil engine which we borrowed from the agricultural college next door and we took a shaving off here and I shined the big the crank up here uh, don't really know how I did that now because the state it were in <laughs> like corrugated iron <laughs> It's amazing. I took it apart piece by piece. I brought it back home, and then then I brought it back. Transported that whole thing back and forth. Of course, this this was the problem, Crazy. you know, Crazy. like the Cornish boiler. Like part of the contract was to jack the thing up and have a look at the bottom. And when we did, you know, we didn't need a boiler inspector. You know, it, you could have put your boot through the bottom. So you know, with lovely old thing made in 1854 by Mr. D. Winton at Carnarvon. Uh, and no doubt brought up the road on horses and carts in way back in 1850. Uh, no good. And down the pub where we stayed, there were a, a fine body of lads who, who worked for the Coast Guard. And one of them said, I know where there's a boiler not very far away at Port de Norway, belonging to Mr. Roberts at Port Pie Manufacture. Anyway, we went seeing Mr. Roberts and cut a long story short. He gave us the boiler, well, he gave it to Carnarvon Council, and we got it up here and tested it and installed it next door. It's a vertical cross tube boiler, and it's got 12 cross tubes in, so it's a good steamer. It's a bit like being on top of a 200 foot chimney up here. This is the Dorothea Quarry in North Wales, and when I came to Glen Cleveland to restore the engine, you know, a gentleman came round and he said, come on, I'll show you a wonderful place where there's all sorts of things waiting to be restored, you know, like just down there, there's a beautiful Cornish pumping engine, beam engine in, a, in an engine room and a shaft 700 feet deep that pumped the water out of this big hole behind me. There were once 500 men worked down that hole and in this area alone, up and down the valley, within a mile or so, there were 2,000 and odd people worked all together. And now there's nothing, only all these lovely old ruined buildings. Just a crazy pile of ruins. That's that's nuts. Also, uh, is that slate? Is he like? Is that all like slate slabs that he's walking on? That's so crazy. The like the the stones there on the on the on the, on the sides. Crazy. <laughs> It is like two towns away. We have a lot of old brick buildings and, and um, old chimneys and stuff. And little by little, they, they're not kept up. They fall down or they get knocked down or whatever. But uh, two towns over in the town of Ware, Massachusetts, W-A-R-E, Ware. In the town of Ware, there's a lot of old factories and things like that still. But it's kind of neat because there's like this one road in the center of town. As you enter the town, if you take a right and you go up, and it's like this long, gradual hill that goes on forever. It just like it plateaus out, it goes up, plateaus out. And I was speaking to an old timer in town there one day while I was having a coffee, and he was like, "Oh, you gotta go up this road." I was like, "Yeah, I, I travel that road sometimes." And he was like, "Pay attention. Look at the houses there, and they're, 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 and they are they're gorgeous. They're massive. I didn't even realize it. Three, four story houses, massive. Looks like something that old." millionaire zoned the work on these is beautiful they're gorgeous gorgeous houses and he said well basically those were all built by the guys who owned the uh uh the, the mills the big brick mills the, the people who own the different businesses in the mill would each you know build houses up here and then they would house their employees and they could all walk down the hill to get to work every day they would just walk to work and walk home from work and they housed them that's what these houses are for crazy cool though this is the beam engine here that's been here since 1906 and it was made by Ullman Brothers in Cornwall, a famous engineering company. The thing is, it was installed initially to pump the water out of the quarry next door, which is 600 feet deep. And it gave up finally pumping in 1956 and they replaced by two electric pumps, you know, and did the job for a quarter of the price. And now it's patiently waiting here for some restoration money so I can make it, perhaps make it go again someday. 
every guy like Freddy passes away and that chance goes when away. When it's fully restored and working, a beam engine like this is a magnificent sight. And in the days of Queen Victoria, as well as being used to provide power for industry, engines like this started to bring improvements to domestic life. As the Industrial Revolution progressed and the population grew, the demand for clean water grew as well. Because it provided such an efficient method of pumping water, the beam engine became the basic working machine of the water industry. And it was with the building of pumping stations in the 19th century that the beam engine technology reached its peak. Tees Cottage Pumping Station is on the River Tees at Darlington. My little balancing act demonstrates the smoothness of the precision engineering. It's stuck on with super glue, Fred, and it's really a bit of a kidology, you know, for the kids. Yeah. It's not it's right. Crazy, it? yeah. Never. That's a coin, I, I think. That's a coin on its side just staying on its side as it goes up and down. That is un believable smoothness in that old machine. I don't think it's stuck on that. You don't reckon? Yeah. Well, there you go. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Thing is, he's getting it back on. <laughs> Here goes. First time, how about that then? That was good. Tease Cottage is interesting because you can see here the beginning of the demise of the beam engine. Because just next door there's a gas pumping engine that worked alongside the beam engine from 1914 before replacing it completely in 1926. It's quite a rare engine, Science Museum likes this engine. Yeah. I'm, I've, I must say I've never seen a gas engine as big as this. Well it's a big fella, it's yeah. one of the bigger ones in the country. Yeah. And we got this running all oh, about 10, 12 years ago. Yeah. And quite a risky business because we thought mm. we were going to put all the gas heating out down Connors Cliff Road. Oh yeah. Or cooking the turkeys. Or cooking yeah. the turkeys. <laughs> Nothing coming out the gas cookers. In spite of new types of engines like this one being introduced, the steam engine didn't just disappear. Smaller engines were used for the manufacture of all sorts of domestic products. I found an interesting example of this when I did a restoration job up near Penrith. This is Wetherick's Country Pottery in Cumbria and this wonderful thing behind me here is a blunger. And a blunger, I thought they were kidding me when they mentioned like blunger but that's its real name. And believe it or not this is the last steam driven one in existence. And when I came here about five years ago, the thing were like ready for falling into the into the pit, which mixes the clay up. And, it, and its its whole sort of function is, over the road there, there were a big clay pit in the olden days, and they dug out the clay, which had contained a lot of pebbles, and they put it in this pit, and added water, and then started off the machinery, and it stirred it all up till it were like our old milk chocolate, and the stones fell to the bottom and then they, they, they pumped off the, the liquid clay off the top and it went down into a lagoon over the back here where when, they pumped, when it had settled, the clay settled on the bottom and the water became fairly clear, they pumped the water off the top back up the hill again and sort of when the clay had set they, they dug it out in big blocks and brought it up here and made the pots out of it and really it's like a big Ken Mug Jeff cake mixer it's all ridden by kind of cool. a little steam engine in this engine house. So someone figured out that the clay was there. They could do this method to get the clay up, to make the clay pots. They built the engine to, to be able to... It's just crazy how all that got thought out, placed together, put together, and it worked. This is Josephine, you know. This is the engine that drives the blunder outside. And um, it took me and me assistance about six months, to, seven months to restore it. You know, we pulled the thing to bits and charted it back to Bolton and restored it all and brought it back here and here it is now driving all the machinery in the top of it. Um, that thing you can hear making the noise next door, that's a, that's a boiler. You put a bit too much coal on it, blowing it. <laughs> as far as we know, this is the only example of a steam-driven potter's wheel in existence. In some industries, steam power never replaced water power. Wheel Martin China Clay Heritage Centre is in St Austell. 
here at Wheel Martin, this really is one of the best examples that you could find of a water wheel moving things around on an industrial site. I mean, how long has it been here, Terry, doing this? This 18-foot wheel has been here since about 1902, and it was pumping slurry around the site right up until 1962. It uh, picked up slurry from the pit, and mm. using those pumps down there, yeah. pumped slurry to where it was required. Mm. This is it. <laughs> oh, for an analogy from a long yeah. time ago. This is the core of the business Can here. Have, yeah. The tail end of that uh, water wheel yeah. power supply. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I like how it does a bit of a shudder when it uh, goes into reverse. <laughs> yeah. The thing to remember is that none of these sources of power have ever really gone away. Take water, for instance, we still use it to generate electricity. Oh, yeah. well, here at Festiniog Hydroelectric Power Station, this lake behind me here is a, a thousand foot deep, 14 foot diameter shaft in, under that building over there. And when they pull the plug out, down goes the water and works a, a water turbine a thousand feet down the mountain. Yeah. This thing down here is the main sort of valve that holds back the pressure for a thousand feet up the mountain. And of course you can see why it's rather an hefty piece of engineering. Don't know how they do when they want to change a washer, but, you know, with all that pressure up there. For anyone who doesn't know, this is a very significant um, scene right here. This may be the only time you see Fred with some safety equipment on. Of course, when it opens, the water comes down and through to the water turbine and generates the electricity. Oh, very clean and environmentally friendly. They've really come full circle, you know, all these wonderful new windmills that rather look like aeroplane propellers going round. Somehow or other, I don't think they'll ever beat the steam turbine. This lot here, it all works full bore, you know, and you can drill a two and a half inch hole for an iron bar, or you can forge a big lump of iron two inches square, or a sort of piece of stone in half for foot thick. Uh, so I don't think I've done so bad really out, out of the jump that would all have gone into the scrapyards, but for me. Mm. This weird and wonderful machine is for making iron bands with them for round factory chimneys. Uh, all, the, all the bands at Barn Oldswick were made with this machine. In fact, really, everything here works with the power of steam, you know. Right. All the work on the engines, both at Carnarvon and up at Weatherig's Pottery, has all been done here with this steam-driven machinery. Even renovating my tractor, it's all been done by steam power. That's pretty awesome. Uh, I mean, it really is. This whole thing, him making the bands for the chimneys and things like that himself, and you know, I'm sure like getting into the the steam power, the old engines and stuff, probably did help him out in his uh, other you know adventures. Uh, Fred Dibna, man, thanks so much for the information. I learned a lot through this video, and uh, that's what these videos are going to do for me. I appreciate you guys watching along for the reaction. Uh, I got a great education on this. I hope some of you folks learned some things as well over here. I'm going to uh, leave it at that. I'm going to get out of here and uh, go take care of some other things I've got to do. But uh, I appreciate you guys watching along. Thanks so much for being here with me. Take care of yourselves. Take care of each other. Until next time, rest peacefully, Mr. Dibna. Scroll out. Mm -hmm.